यूनिट एट स्टॉपिंग बाय वर्ड्स ऑन अ स्नोई इवनिंग असलम डियर स्टूडेंट्स इन यूनिट एट वी आर गोइंग टू लुक एट वन ऑफ द ग्रेटेस्ट पोएम्स बाय रॉबर्ट फ्रॉस्ट रॉबर्ट ली फ्रॉस्ट इज अ सेलिब्रेटेड अमेरिकन पोएट ऑफ द ट्वेंटी सेंचुरी He won four Pulitzer Prizes in poetry. His remarkable skills of depicting rural scenes and pastoral life set him apart from his contemporaries. Another unique feature of his poetry is the use of ordinary American colloquial speech. This is all the more remarkable because behind this apparent simplicity, he often deals with themes of social and philosophic importance. In short, we must not be misled by the evident simplicity of his poems instead we should dig deep for wider interpretations now stopping by words on a snowy evening was written in 1922 and was published the following year in the poetry collection called new hampshire new hampshire isn't that a name of a state in the us yes you are right but the title of his book comes from a poem of the same name and there is an interesting story about it it is said that once he stayed up late at night and was busy writing this long poem called new hampshire when he realized that morning had come he went out to look at the sunrise and got an idea for stopping by words on a snowy evening he wrote this short poem in just few minutes and it turned out to be one of his masterpieces okay that's enough background now who will read out the poem aloud sir i will whose woods these are i think i know his house is in the village door he will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow my little horse must think it it will To stop, to stop without, without a farmhouse farm near, between the woods and, and frozen lake, the darkest, darkest evening of the year. year. He, He gives, gives his harness bells a shake to, to ask if there is some mistake. mistake. The but only other sounds the sleep of easy wheeling and downy down lane. The, the woods are lovely, lovely dark, dark and deep, deep but, but I have promises to keep and, and miles to go before I sleep. And, and miles, miles to, to go, go before, before I sleep. Excellent. Now let's start analyzing the poem. What do you understand by the title? Sir, I think the title says the scene and the timing of the poem. There's someone stopping beside the forest. It is evening and the snow is falling. Perfect. Now the poem begins with the line, "Whose woods these are? I think I know." Can you identify the speaker here? The speaker is probably the poet himself. Okay. And what does he tell us? He refers to a nearby forest and says that he knows the owner of this forest. Right. Now look at the rest of the lines in the first stanza and tell me what else he says. Sir, the poet says that the owner of this forest lives in a village, so he will not be able to see the poet observing the snowfall on his forest. And why does the poet make that statement? Do you think the owner will be annoyed if he finds out the poet watching the snowfall on his forest? I don't think so. The poet is not trespassing. He is not taking anything away. He is merely watching snowfall on the forest. I don't think he is afraid of being seen. I see. Well, maybe the poet feels guilty because it is not expected of wise people to stop their journey. merely to watch the snowfall that is without any seriousness of purpose now i want you to pay attention to the word woods woods and trees recurrently appear in frost's poems they have special significance they represent a world of wilderness a world that offers peace solitude or an escape a world that attracts the idle aimless wanderers whereas the word village refers to a different kind of world it represents a world of people and social obligations a world of civilization and responsibility now look at the first stanza again the owner is a sensible person who owns woods 
for the monetary benefits. He doesn't stay out there to enjoy its beauty. He prefers to live in the village, as any wise, civilized person should. Consequently, the poet can draw solitary aesthetic pleasure without fear of being watched. Oh, I hadn't thought of it this way. The second stanza supports this interpretation even further. The poet is conscious that his pony must find it strange to stop in the wilderness and that too during the darkest evening of the year. In such circumstances, any sane and civilized person would hurry along to his destination or find a nearest shelter. The pony is a domestic animal and has been taught the ways of the society. So the pony acts as an agent of the civilized world, as a reminder that it is not advised to hang out at such odd hours in such mercilessly cold weather. I see. And the pony can raise this message in the next stanza by shaking his harness bells. Exactly. And the poet is aware that his pony feels uncomfortable and doesn't understand the purpose of stopping out there. But the poet is enchanted by the sights and sounds of the place. He listens to the subtle hiss of the wind and can even discern the sound of the snowflakes. We must also note here that the hissing sound of the sweeping wind has an effect of a lullaby and the softness of the downy flakes has the connotation of a blanket or a pillow. But sir, how can downy flakes give the meaning of blankets or pillows? Well, the word downy describes something made of or covered with fine, soft hair, feather or feather-like material. Do you think these sights and sound make the poet sleepy? Well, I can't say that with certainty, but some readers feel it that way. The sweeping wind and downy flakes have a kind of intoxicating or hypnotizing impact, and it could prove fatal if the poet loses his consciousness here. It'll be equal to abandoning his rational faculties or even letting go the struggle of life. It is particularly obvious in the last stanza, where the poet is tempted by the charming words that are dark and deep, that is, sinful and mysterious. Oh, that is really scary. Well, luckily our poet says, but I have promises to keep. What does this line mean? Sir, it means the poet has other commitments to fulfill, so he can't afford to stay there any longer. Yes, and these commitments remind him that he still has a long way to go before he can let sleep overcome his senses. But why does he repeat the line and miles to go before I sleep? It may mean that the poet is already half asleep and repeats these words like a hypnotized person. Yes, it is as if his inner voice reminds him of his obligations. It creates a sense of urgency to take an immediate action in order to break the spell cast by the beauty of the words. Sleep in the last line may also mean death. In other words, the poet has to travel a long distance before he takes the eternal rest. It was interesting to analyze the poem in detail, but could you tell us what the central idea of the poem is? Well, you may say that the poem depicts a conflict between beauty and duty. There is an inner urge in us to be swept away by the temptation of the beautiful, but we must struggle hard to attend to our duties. We must strike a balance between our wild passions and civic responsibilities. I hope now you can respond to the poem with much enhanced understanding. Thank you.